All right, guys, welcome back to the Smalley Chaser channel. We are going to talk today about the pre-spawn transition and the spawn for smallmouth bass in our river systems, okay? I know it's early, okay? It's, it's March. Uh, March is here, um, and we know we're not going to really begin to see the spawning until May, late May, probably. all depends on what those crucial factors are we always talk about. But I want to get ahead of it. I want to get ahead um, and get on the Smalley Chaser channel to provide you guys with a lot more of the content that I'll, I do in the Smallmouth newsletter. Okay? Um, a lot of people have asked me to do it in video form or in Spotify form so they can listen to it, you know, on the road, on, on your morning commute, or things like that, as opposed to um, solely just the newsletter. Uh, I guess a lot less people read these days. Um, is one way to look at it. But I cannot get started without thanking Power Queen. Um, Power Queen is the headline sponsor powered by for our smallmouth fishing series, the Smalley Chaser River Bassin series. I cannot thank Power Queen enough. We give a battery a month away um, at our monthly events beginning in March through September um, for anglers participating in that, sponsored by Power Queen. And also... Um, the Ashigan Coffee Blend, okay? Ashigan Coffee Blend. You guys, be on the lookout for the Ashigan Coffee Blend coming up. Um, if you're in our series, you're likely going to get uh, some uh, um, Ashigan Blend uh, to try out, okay? Um, so it's all smally themed um, coffees. Um, so it's going to be awesome. And um, let's kick this off by talking about where we are today, okay? We are March 1st today and we're experiencing sort of the carryover effect of fe of uh, February's weather patterns from snow to a lot of rain a lot more rain at the end of the month to some really erratic gyrations in our river rivers okay some have fared well some have fared better than others okay um, but for the most part we've seen these constant fluctuations between four and a half feet and 11 feet up and down up and down especially if you're talking like the upper Potomac if you're talking to Doa, Shenandoah, it's a little, you know, it's down from that, um, you know, more of like that four to like eight, okay, four to seven. Same with the Rappahannock and different river systems like that. The news has been all over the place, okay, um, and same with the James River. The James has been kind of like almost like three different river systems in the last like 30 days, okay, because you've got the upper Potomac, the mid, I'm um, sorry, the upper James, the middle James, and you've got the tidal, right? And, you know, Richmond kind of in the middle where the fall line is. And it's been a complete show, okay? Um, I've crossed the bridge numerous times over the last few weeks, um, going to see family. Um, and big shout out to everyone. And I mean this genuinely. Everybody that has reached out to me um, regarding the loss of my mom um, in the last week and a half, Um 93 years, she led a wonderful life, and I have a lot of my acumen for fishing and my passion for rivers and biology and all that goes to my mother. Um, so I know she's always going to be watching over me all the time, but especially when I'm out on the river. Um, she was just an awesome, awesome lady. So I hope, uh, I want to thank everyone who's reached out to me personally um, regarding my mom in the, since December. Uh, since she came back home for hospice care. Um, I've been making that run up and down 95 to Richmond, um, you know, as much as I could in the last uh, few weeks. Um, so I've crossed the James River. I've crossed the James River and I've crossed the Rap... Let's put it this way. I've crossed the Potomac, the Rappahannock, and the James River about a dozen times, okay? Um, just in the last like month or so, all right? I'm um, going up and back to Richmond. Um and so I've seen the rivers just visually, you know, and I've not been on them, you know what I mean? But I've seen them from the bridge in the different bridges that I've used to cross um, those river systems. And they've been a show, an absolute shit show, okay, from, from water clarity to blown out to all that. So when we talk about pre-spawn, all of that is going to be, is going to impact our timetable cycle for spawn, Okay. Everything right now until the spawn, okay, is basically your pre-spawn transition. And I know a lot of you have probably never heard that expression. You hear fall transition, but you don't ever hear anybody people talk about uh, uh, the pre-spawn transition, okay? Because 
these bass, especially in our river systems, have been scattered everywhere for months now, okay? Especially on my river, okay? Finding them has been probably the hardest it's been in eight months because the fluctuations of the water, they've gone up into the creek, they've come back out. They're at the mouth of the Monoxy, they're nowhere to be found, right? They're all the way up the mountain, they've coming back. Okay, all your creek. They're, they're like feeling that gyration of the river levels, inconsistency with all that snow melt from up north, rainfall here. They're dealing with that, and they're used to dealing with that stuff, but it, it gets them into that, you know, equilibrium issue where they really just are going to go to the middle river, right? And they're going to camp out, and that's typically where I found my fish, okay, during February, um, is they're not really making any moves anywhere else unless, of course, you get a blowout. What I mean by that is the river goes from 4 feet to 11 feet and then pushes them out because of that current coming down so fast. They don't want any part of that. They're going to stay off to the sides, pushes them towards the banks and the rocks and those beyond the seams, and then that's when we caught most of our fish, okay? Um, and we located most of our fish. Now the river settles back down. We may get a little bit more rain and stuff coming, um, some weather in the first week of March. But after that, we should begin what is really that pre-spawn cycle, that life cycle that every bass goes through every single year, okay? And it basically signals a change in their behavior, okay? Okay. Their physiology changes, all right? So what do we mean by that? Behaviors, okay? Your water is more, your water is warming up, okay? No, okay, depending on your, your river system, if you're mine, like mine, and you got tons of rock, that's thermal. That is where they have been, okay? Because they still want to have some kind of warmth throughout the winter, right? Okay, they're not in, they're not in that cold water, oxygenated water, sitting in that, exerting all that energy throughout the winter time, right? Okay, that's not where they've been, okay? They've been outside that, usually on the tail side, okay? Usually on the outside scene or in stable water. They prefer clearer water. So if you can find clearer water that in winter time, late winter, right now, that's where they're going to be, okay? Um... Now, as we move into March, April, and May, they will begin to move back into that oxygenated, clear, flowing water, okay? Because they're going to start feeding again. And why are they going to start feeding again? Because they know they're going to exert a lot of energy once again, okay, for the spawning period, okay? It's a clock, okay? And as those waters warm up, okay, they know winter is coming to an end, okay, and that is a different different period. Um, now, the biggest differentiator I'm, I tell people about smallmouth in all of the cycles, but especially pre-spawn and spawn, is whether or not you're targeting lake fish or river fish, okay. And I've gotten the newsletter um, that I put out this week, a kind of a breakdown of the differences between lake smallmouth and river smallmouth and their behaviors. They are very different fish, okay? We know this, you know, just simply by looking at their appearance and their size, right? We know there's a difference between our northern lake smallmouth and our southern smallmouth, okay? In terms of disposition, in terms of their migration patterns, and in terms of their overall size and length. What you tend to find, for example... You tend to find new river smallmouth to be longer and leaner. There's a greater chance of you catching a citation smallmouth bass in the new river than there is the Susquehanna River. And that, of course, is always debated, okay, um, by the small elites, okay, of which river. But the reality of it is the Susquehanna is chock full of smallmouth. But if you go up there and you catch 100 fish, okay, how many of them are going to be citation? right? You got out of the new river, you catch eight fish, you got a better chance of getting a citation out of that number eight than you do probably out of 50 or 60, okay, up on the Susquehanna. It's just because the populations are different, okay? Their development, their environments are different, okay? Um, the, while their behaviors may be the same, right, because they all spawn and they all go through the same cycles, 
Okay, the size, northern lakes, smallmouth just get big bellies, okay, broad shoulders. They're just bigger, but they're shorter, okay? Um, that goes for the lakes, okay? Lakes versus rivers, right? River smallmouth tend to be a lot more active, in my opinion, exerting a lot more energy throughout the year in a river than necessarily a lake. They're exerting more energy. Therefore, they tend to be leaner, in my opinion, just simple biology. It's like they're at the gym 24-7, okay? Um, and so that, that plays into effect. But how you fish for them in the pre-spawn is considerably different, in my opinion, between a river and a lake. In rivers, you will find tagged smallmouth have moved 15 to 20 miles. Tagged smallmouth from the fall to the spring. So during the winter, they've moved. Why did they move? Upriver, downriver, 15 miles. And then where are they going to go from there? They're not going to necessarily return. This is one of those myths out there. Smallmouth bass tend to, not, they don't tend to, to, to spawn in the same exact areas they spawn the previous year. Just like they don't have the same partners, okay? Um, you know, female, female smallmouth and male smallmouth bass are basically one night stands. They're one day stands on a nest. Okay, they meet, they mate, they're gone. They're gone. Like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, they're, it's like a one night stand. Okay, um, they're not like, you know, building a family. Okay, um, and a lot of times these female and these males will mate with more than one female and these females, if they're, if they're older and they're carrying, you know, a significant amount of eggs and that male doesn't have the sustainable milk, it's called milk, doesn't have the sustainable milk in order to provide, let's put it this way, doesn't have how we would characterize it as can't go again, okay, um, that female's going to find another male, okay, that's the way it is, all right, and so it's like, like that for both, okay, um, you know, if the male still has more to go and the other female has, has dropped all of her eggs, these eggs can be anywhere from 2,000 to 15,000. There are some studies that show it's upwards of 20,000 eggs per female bass, really depending upon the age. Um, if she's done dropping her eggs and she's moved off, she's done. She's done her business, okay? And that male still got something to go. He's going to go find another female, okay? I mean, he, that can happen. And so there's, there's that, there's that kind of like dynamic of guarding the nest and then the, the urge, and so another female could roll right in to that nest, okay? And then she's going to drop her eggs right on top of those other eggs or right on that nest near those other eggs, and he's, he's, he's still got it to go. So, I mean, this, these things happen, okay? Um, but when you want to look at the transition period, you're looking at right now where are these bass looking to go. Now, they're not going today. Okay, we need to get that water temperature above 55 degrees. Then we need to get it over 60 degrees. So the transition is really that phase from about 40 degrees, 40, 42 degree water temperature in your river to 55. That's when they're train. They're it's a slow trans. They're feeding up. They're gonna go. They're gonna be predicated on feeding for this process, and then they're gonna move towards. Closer, closer to where they already have, call it crazy, but they already have a preconceived notion of where they are going, where the males know where they're going to go. They're highly territorial in lakes, more so than rivers, in my opinion, okay? I actually think because there's less places to spawn, you know, productively in a lake um, than a river, okay? Um... And so they're going to feed up both females and males. The males are going to make their way. So you're going to be coming into what are pods of really all males that are moving around your river system, okay, into spring, feeding up first. But they're also in search of the right type of, right type of rocky, rocky river composition, okay, bedrock, gravel, sand, stuff and areas within where they are at the time the water the water is beginning to rise above 50 and they're going to stay territorial in a general area knowing they're, they're recognizing their own physiological change 
and it's about that time, okay, for spawning. Okay, now there are tons of things in a river system. I say this as opposed to a lake. It's harder to determine in the river system because you've got high, high water events. You could have droughts. You could have all kinds of stuff that will influence the spawn and the timing of the spawn, okay? But at some point, the females are going to come looking for nests, okay? So there's really two transitions when we talk about a transition in the spring pre-spawn. The male transition, which begins first, both times, okay? The male transition is they're out feeding and they're also out looking at areas, whether consciously or not, we don't we don't know what we think because they're pretty damn skilled at it. When you look at some of these beds, outstanding bed generation, okay, highly skilled smallmouth bass, okay, um, and then you have the females. Well, the females are basically feeding up, okay. They know they're going to go through spawn. They know they're going to go through their whole cycle of of of, care, of generating the eggs, carrying the eggs, all that stuff. Um, so they're basically, you know, they're not moving necessarily around as much in my opinion as the males are they tend to be a little bit behind them um you know in terms of that i believe the females are more cognizant of water temperature than the males are the males tend to exert more energy they're a lot more like out and about moving around um you know um in terms in terms of that late like right now um, before we talk about even them creating a nest, okay? Um, so that's the first part of the transition, right? It's just kind of like getting out from that winter slumber. And that second part of that pre-spawn transition is the males actually going and making, and then the females coming behind them, transitioning to the nest. Th that transition of the female from the middle of the river, a lot of times you're not going to find, doesn't, again, every river needs to be looked at on its own. Okay, I it's been my experience. I have not generally found as many spawning nests in the middle of my rivers. Okay, that would be the James and that would be the Upper Potomac that I have predominantly fished in my life. Okay, I believe that's because of the current. They don't males aren't making nests where they know there is a chance or a predominant kind of river condition like rising water or current, even the slightest, that the water's moving too swiftly, okay? They tend to make them towards the outside of that. So when you're out in March, okay, and you're fishing, understand that if your water level is what it is and your water level is the same a month from now, a month and a half from now, two months from now, say five feet, four feet, and you see how that water is breaking in the seams coming down river around boulders around rock that are exposed and then you've got a little bit you know that tailwind you know i call it the tail hook of a current or of a seam and it's a little bit more like calmer or steadier water go on over there and check out that river composition now okay you can get out of your kayak and get in the river okay and look if it's sandy or easily dispersed, even like shell beds in my river, okay? You know, easy, easily dispersed where they can have a sandy, hardened bottom. They're going to spawn there. If there's fish in that area, they're going to spawn there, okay? Um, it's just a matter of how many, you know? And we do find that a lot in our rivers, in my opinion, as opposed to lakes. You'll find a lot of nests together in areas, and I, I think it's because males stay in pods together and they find them in a general area, maybe like a 25-yard, a 30-yard stretch of lichen river composition. As opposed for me, my experience at least, you know, in Maryland especially, um, they're not as close together. They're more spread out. Now, most people don't know this. There's no natural lakes in Maryland. Zero. They're all man-made. They're all impoundments of rivers or something. Now, there's one that they're, gonna, they're probably going to try. Maryland's the only, only state in the country that I'm aware of that has that phenomenon for its lakes. Okay, we've got some great western region, western Maryland lakes with smallmouth, okay? And they behave completely different than the upper Potomac smallmouth, okay? So if you visit a place like Jennings Randolph, awesome, awesome smallie lake, right? 
you know, based on our standards in Maryland, okay, um, and probably Virginia, those two, um, they spawn different. Their pre-spawn is different. They stay deeper. They spawn deeper. River fish tend to spawn in three to five feet of water, okay? Lake fish tend to spawn in deeper water, can go upwards of 10 to 12 feet, okay? So on points and on things like that, okay? So as far as water temperature, the pre-spawn phase is triggered by water temperature, okay? It does not matter whether we're talking largemouth bass, spotted bass, or smallmouth bass, okay? If I'm, we're talking spots, we're including Kentucky bass and Alabama bass in that mix, okay? 45 to 55 degrees triggers the, the normal, like, transition zone. It's, you know, they're going to actually lay those eggs closer to 60, okay? But they're going to begin to move, make that move. Um, largemouth and spotted bass will tend to make that transition sooner, okay? On the lower end range of that 45 to 55. Smallmouth tend to want it to be warmer, okay? Warmer and clearer, okay? Um, small, look, the sign of a he health, healthy smallmouth population is indicative of a healthy fishery because smallmouths do, smallmouth generally do not like polluted or clouded water. They don't, okay? They prefer swift running, clear, oxygenated water, okay? Um, they'll tolerate it for a certain period of time, but... You know, they they predominantly like like it to be that way. And there are other bass that don't, you know, um, that don't mind it, you know. Um, and so that's where it, where it is. Now, remember, largemouth and smallmouth, they're both in, quote, unquote, deeper. There's that winterized deeper, although we, people were catching citation smally shallow in December in the smally river chasing back, uh, series, as well as in November and in January and in February, right? Okay, like... Okay, that, that's just one of those things where we think that all the fish move to deeper water. But you've got to define what deep is for your river because the fish are going to do that. Okay, if your river is generally only three to four feet, normal pool, deeper water is only going to be a foot more water. Okay, or an indention in that three or four feet behind a rock, underneath a boulder, right? Okay, that's where they were going to be, that's where they would winterize. All right, and so you got to think about that. Okay, it's, again, every river is different. Susquehanna, much wider river than, say, the Shenandoah, the Ravon, the Rapidan, right? The Rappahannock, the, you know? I mean, much wider river. So it's a completely different thing. Got to look at each river separately um, when they look for these staging areas. And that's the other thing is during this pre-spawn, they can be staged in different areas and then get hit with a high water event which scatters them again and then it starts back over again okay that's what a lot of people miss is if you have a high water event in early may the clock has to get reset the water temperatures have to like okay do their thing the river tends to have to come down they'll spawn during a high water event if they're forced to if it happens to be the timing is the males have already moved to make the nest. They're have already made the nest. The feet that hard water event, the females are going to get triggered. They're going to come in. They're going to lay their eggs, and we're going to have a bad spawn. Okay, you know, two thirds of our spawn is going to get obliterated in a high water event. It's happened. Happened on the Upper Potomac in 2018. I think 16 and 18. Okay, um, and that's why we have such a yearling class differentiator in size where there's a gap because we basically lost the spawning class during the flood of 2018. It impacted that spawning class to where the survival rate was very, very low. Okay, now we've had two really good spawning classes in the last two years, so we're going to have a healthy, younger fish population. Okay, for the next two years. All right, because they made it through. All right, um, and so they're two years old or three years old. Okay, and so that's why we're tending to see more 15s and 16s. And think about it. If you caught those fish last year and they were 16s and 17s, they're going to be 18, 19s, and maybe 20s this year. Okay? It really, really all depends on your river. All right? So they go to those staging areas between the wintering holes and then their transition lines and their points for spring. And to, again, to eat up again and to feed up again. Because what happens in spring? Everything comes back to life. Spring has sprung. Right? That's what they said. So you've got forage, you've got grass, you've got all the stuff coming back, 
all the noises, all the great things, frogs coming out, crawfish are going to come back out. Now, mind you, let me just say this to people to bust this myth. On the Upper Potomac and the Monocacy in February, there were crawfish, crayfish in the river bottom. Now, not like crazy, okay? But because of the high water events that we sustained in January and February, it disturbed the river bottom. Remember, they're not going dormant. Crawfish do not go dormant, okay? Most people think they go dormant. They don't. They burrow and they stay in the mud, okay? Until such time the water temperatures rise and they come out. But if a high water event comes down the river and disturbs the river bottom and disturbs their burrow, guess what? They're back out into the river, okay? And they've got to deal with that cold water, until such time they can bury back, burrow back down. So we saw them in Minoxy and the Upper Potomac February. Okay? So, again, that's wintertime. Okay? Snow on the ground. Crawfish in the river. Okay? It's biology. It's what happens naturally in the river systems. Lakes don't have to deal with that nonsense. Okay? Lakes are more stable. And that's why the behaviors tend to be different. Okay? Uh, points and ledges, okay? Prefer structure and cover. Bass will concentrate around points and underwater ledges during the pre-spawn. These structures offer proximity to deeper water typically, and they state they provide a transitional zone as they begin to start feeding. In terms of vegetation, it's all submerged vegetation at this point, okay? Um, you got to remember that. You got hydrilla, milfoil. They can all attract the pre-spawn bass as that comes in um, and gets healthier, um, uh, you know, as well as attracting food sources. So remember that. But again, fallen trees, brush piles, you know, that kind of cover all, is always a focal point of, of smallmouth and largemouth. Um, so let's talk about the spawning. What do we expect with the spawning behavior? River-dwelling smallmouth bass will spawn in areas of current but with also areas of gravel and rocky substrate. Now, what kind of rocky substrate are we talking about? We're talking about gravel, bedrock, sand. I actually would add shell. Because if you're walking in that, if you walk in like the Upper Potomac and the Pennyfield section, all the way up to Old Dam 2, there's tons of shell. And as you're walking, you basically are moving that shell away. Well, that's what that bass is going to do with his tail. Is He's going to just create that broom-like action to create that nest. And underneath the shell typically is a sandy bottom. And that ends up being perfect um, for them. That flowing water helps oxygenate the, the eggs, okay, a after the female lays the eggs, all right? Um, and remember, she can lay anywhere from 2,000 to 15,000 eggs. So um, the behavior, like I said, becomes nomadic, um, moving throughout the river during the pre-spawn um, while they are feeding up. Um, it can be a great, great time. My experience is I've already gotten kind of my allocation for March um, of, of uh, lipless crankbaits, vibrating blade baits, um, vibrating jigs, blade baits, things like that. Things that, depending on your water clarity, depending on how deep your water is, um, are always really great because the bass, the males are out moving around more, okay? And so, and when they want to feed up, they're going to chase a little bit more. They're certainly going to chase more than they did from November to February. Okay, um, you know, and you still want to check those those normal haunts, okay, those seams behind boulders, the eddies, all of that stuff, okay, um, slowly but surely. And you're also dependent upon what year class you have in your river system predominantly because the bigger fish are going to behave different than the smaller ones. The younger ones are going to get out, those seven, those eight to like, you know, eight to like 10, maybe even 12 inch, you're going to see them more in pods out than necessarily that that 18 to 20, okay? Um, and I'm not really sure exactly what the reasons necessarily are for that, why why they're kind of like the late movers, um, but it just tends to happen that way, um, you know, for, for pre-spawn. And then after spawn, you get into them, okay? Um, Smallmouth bass in lakes, okay? Remember lakes. In lakes, they typically spawn in shallow rocky areas with less current compared to river systems. And even shallier creeks or feeders to the lake or tailouts in rivers, okay? Like, uh, Lake-dwelling smallmouth may establish a home range, specific areas of the lake during, from pre-spawn that they're going to stay in and they're going to spawn in, unlike river smallies, which will move multiple, multiple miles from January and February to May, okay? 
Um, if you spot an area like I have in the last year, and you can message me if you fish my area, where I've seen predominantly new grass growth come in, especially in the Virginia side of the Potomac, um, they're going to move to that grass in the springtime. And then if you find any gravel or bedrock or sand, uh, sandy area flat or anything like that, chances are that's where they're going to spawn. Okay? Um, so look for that new grass that you found last year that was new coming back this year. Okay? You can do all that in March to prepare for where they may spawn. Okay? We talked about the sizes. We've talked about the regional differences. The northern region and southern region, it's all in the newsletter article. Okay? Kind of breaks it all down. Most of the stuff most of you guys, you know, probably understood. I also break down exactly, you know, the spawning process. Okay, this video I'm just talking about the pre-spawn that's going to get us to that spawn. I'll do another video on the actual spawn. Okay, what happens when the male decides to go make the nest. Okay, and then what happens when the female transitions away from that nest. For me, I will just say... Um, I prefer to target the female after she's laid her eggs. I leave the males alone on the nest. I will target the males during transition because I'm going to catch and releasing them back. They're going to, their, their biology is their biology. They're going to get reacclimated and they're going to know they're going to go keep doing their thing and they're going to go make their nest weeks later or wherever, whenever it is. Okay? So I don't mind catching the male during the pre-spawn and in the transition phase. I don't target males ever. Guarding, I don't really target bass at all guarding a nest. I don't. It's just an ethical line in the sand for me. Okay? Plenty of people do. Okay? Um, I just think it, if you want a sustainable fishery, don't do it. Don't complain about your fishery tanking and going to shit if everybody is like, okay, Cayuga. Okay? If you've got bass tournaments going up there when no one else can fish there and no one else can fish that lake, because it's to protect the spawn, and then they let the pros go up in there and beat that shit for seven to ten days, and just crush freaking smallmouth bass, and then they had a bad spawn, okay? And so this year, when these guys go up to Cayuga again, we'll see what happens. I mean, I have my notions of what I think is going to be, but you know, I could be wrong. Um, but I'm just saying it. It it was bad. It was bad. A lot of dead fish. A lot of like you know big fish dead. Okay, we're talking. Six, five, six pound smallmouth two and three days after that event were found dead in Cayuga. Okay? Just saying, busted up lips. How many times were they caught? Ain't nobody was fishing there but the pros. Okay? Just saying, tournaments. Just saying. They're not going back to Cayuga this year, are they friends? Wonder why. Okay? Um, think about it. Protect your resource. But you're free to do what you want to do. I'm done ranting. Um, I just I just will target the females as they leave the nest out and about. I'll leave the males to guard the fry. I don't disturb the nest. I don't want to take a male off a nest. Because what happens? When you take a male off that nest, guys, prey. Okay? You become the predator. All right? You've removed the guardian of, that, of the future of your fishery, and something else is going to roll up in there and decimate those eggs. And then you're not going to have any fish. Okay? That's how I look at it. I could be wrong. You can tell me I'm wrong. It's fine. It's just how I feel about it. Is I just feel like it's not the right thing, ethical thing to do. Um, but plenty of people do it. All right? So if you go to the article, um, you can find it in the Smalley Chaser Bassing Series um, Facebook page. I'll post the article. Link. You can subscribe to the newsletter. I mean, these will come to your inbox. You can get them um, every time um, we go through. It's all behavioral, habitat, Catch how you can catch, breaking down some different river systems, what to look for, a bunch of just stuff to make you a better smallie chaser, okay, is really all that it's about. Um, you know, float. the last one we did was the Upper James River float trips from the cow pasture in Jackson all the way down to Snowden. All the access, the float trips, you know, how long it's going to take you, how many miles it is, the good areas to fish, all that good stuff. That's kind of what the newsletter is. It's free, guys. Take advantage of it. Get out there on the river. Um and fish for those smallmouth. Um, you know, with the weather changing here in March, join the free March monthly if you're a kayak bass angler. You can find that on Turning X, Smalley Chaser River Bassin, um, and join us. Uh, it's a free monthly. Again, free, 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 free. Okay, so if you're going to be out fishing, there's no kayak fishing, um, 
there's really no reason why you shouldn't join the free monthly if you're fishing for smallmouth and you're fishing one of the designated rivers, okay? River only, smallmouth only in that series. There's other series where you could fish for both largemouth and smallmouth in Virginia and Maryland, West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, and they're on Turning X and Fishing Chaos. You can check those out. Uh, just do a search for your river. Um, and events on that river will come up. And then you can always, always read the rules, okay? Um, and... You know, so that's that sums up that kind of like that pre-spawn like transition. I'm gonna, like I said, I'll do another video on the actual spawn, uh, baits specific. Um, you know, again, I might have, I think I threw in here some of the baits in the newsletter. Um, lore selection, yeah, I did angling strategy. So I always try to throw in an angling strategies um, in there. See, so anything that's gonna you're gonna have anything during the pre-spawn, it's basically gonna provide an easy meal for your smallmouth bass. Um, you know, it's still a little early. They're gonna be, like I said before, there's crayfish already in my river, but most of the time that's up that's around the spawn or after the spawn. You really see the like the density of the crayfish. But bait fish are gonna be out, you know, they're gonna, you know, um, and their change of coming out and those temperature changes. So, like I said, lipless crankbaits, even still the blade baits that use during during the winter time, are still going to be effective during that transition. Anything with a lot of erratic, I mean, I, I'll tell you what, one, two of my favorites are coming from the same. Has nothing to do with them being affiliated with the series or not. It's just, it's, it's I absolutely love them. Is the jaw dropper because of its erratic, erratic. We're just searching on YouTube some great videos of people showing this. It's an erratic, different action. The head is completely different um, than anything else on the market, in my opinion. I also love their top spin because it's small and compact. It reminds me a lot of like the old beetle spins we threw when we were little. But it's just more compact with that top blade and it just gets down a little bit more. And I like it because it's small enough and compact that the smallies just inhale it. Um, I also like the fact that they're one of the few that actually have a molten craw coloration. Like, how hard is it to find like the damn red... You know, Z-Man freaking uh, jig heads that are red. Everyone has to, like, use their, their wife or their girlfriend's freaking nail polish to paint them red because they never have the damn red anywhere. Boom. Solution. Right there. Jaw dropper. First gen fishing. Check check them out. Okay? Um, And then, you know, like I said before, lipless cranks, various sizes. I tend to like small. The reason why I tend to like the smaller ones during this, if you got some of them old, old... uh rattle traps, the old cotton cordels. You got any of that old jank? Throw it. Break it out. If it's small, near, uh, thin and small with act, you're going to get bit, okay, during the pre-spawn, okay, because they're looking for easy meals. That doesn't mean you can't go out there and throw a giant ass spit, swim bait and catch a big bass. You can't, because that's a myth. Small mouth will freaking take out a six inch and eight inch, okay, swim bait, all right? They will. You're just your bites are just going to be fewer. Okay, um, so keep that in mind. Um, again, finessing your tubes will still work. You know, to some extent, um, you still want to be slow a little, a little bit slower. Changing your cadence a little bit, but then going back to that slow because the water temperature is still under 55. Okay, so you know, burning baits isn't really going to work for you. Okay, that crankbait, that square bill is going to work for you. It all comes down to really that size. Always using the pre-spawn coming out of this winter time. Go with a one thump thumper. Okay, go with something with some noise. Don't go the whole silent route. All right, that's not going to work for you. Um, you know, if you're in a little deeper water, use a little deeper, uh, deeper uh, crankbait lip. Okay, um, to get down because they're still going to be down. Okay, they're still going to be down in March. All right, they're not going to be at that top water level. Okay, and they're not necessarily all going to be like shallow. You're going to find them in six to eight feet of water. If you have that depth in your river system, okay, um, you know I know my buddy, one of my buddies, you know around here tells me he, he he finds it easier to target them in the lake than in the river, um, you know because the depths are so much easy and plus he can use his electronics and he can just find them really quickly at Seneca Lake, little Seneca Lake, and he's pulling five and six pound freaking smallmouth out of there. That's a that's a pretty high pressured fishery, but you know he goes, you know he's pulling he pulls at least two or three five pounders a month from spring, summer, and the fall out of that lake, um, you know, and so, you know, he know he, he, he knows where to find them, 
And and he actually told me when I had this discussion with him the other night about, you know, what he thought, what I thought about Little Seneca, what he thought about Little Seneca Lake this year. And he even said, he goes, he goes, you know, it's kind of crazy, but in that lake, they'll spawn on the sloping sides. There's a bridge that goes over Little Seneca Lake, okay, um, to Clarksburg, I guess. And, um, and there's sloping sides to the banks, okay, near that bridge. They'll, they'll lay their eggs on an incline. And you'll see, he showed me pictures of beds that were basically not flat on a river bottom, right? Not flat on a lake bottom, okay? They were up on an angle. And so it was kind of crazy. So that, that tells you, I mean, again, lake smallies and river smallies, completely different animals, okay, during, during the spawn, in my opinion. Um, I thank you guys for tuning in. Again, just check out the newsletter. It's got a lot more informative information than the video. It just kind of breaks it all down for you. Again, I want to thank Power Queen for sponsoring the channel, sponsoring this video, as well as the Ashigan Coffee Blend coming to an event near you um, this year. Uh, if you got any questions, you can hit me up on Facebook uh, at the Smalley Chaser River Bassin Series on Facebook. And please like and subscribe to this new channel here on YouTube where we're only going to talk really about smallmouth, chasing smallies and all those things in 2024. Thanks, guys.